I am the uh, director of the Webster Center for Creative Innovation. And this center has uh, meetings about every, every two months and we invite very exciting speakers case in point here with Wendy. Um, and uh, basically, if you don't know about our center, we are an interdisciplinary center. Uh, I'm a psychologist by training, but the center sits in between all the departments at uh, Webster. Um, so this is part of the WCCI lecture series, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Wendy, who is an expert on many, many topics, actually. But just to name a few, we have well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with cognitive psychology and science, really serendipity, um, accidents, uncertainty, chance, and she's gonna to talk to us about accidental thinking, serendipity and creativity. And just to tell you a little bit more, and I don't wanna forget anything, so I'm, I'm just gonna read it, although I do know this. Wendy Ross is senior lecturer in psychology at London Metropolitan University. Her research looks at the role of uncertainty and accidents in a generation of new knowledge, which uh, she researches uh, using both experimental and ethnographic techniques. She's co-chair of the Serendipity Society, vice president of the Possibility Studies Network, and a member of the BPS Cognitive Section Committee. She has been uh, involved in two edited collections, uh, and actually we have one, one here, an edited volume on the art of serendipity that I'm happy to circulate. And um, she is also, of course, part of the Journal of Possibility Studies and Society. And she won an award, Frank Barron, from uh, the American Psychological uh, Asso uh, Association for her contribution, uh, early contribution to creativity uh, research. So, Wendy, it's a great pleasure to have you. And I think I'm going to just give you the floor and then we'll have questions. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'll just downplay, I don't know all of science. I'm not an expert on science, which is what Vlad said. Some parts of science I know, but I wouldn't say I'm an expert on, on science. Um, so I was just going to tell you a bit about me, so you know where I'm coming from and what I'm, and what I'm doing. Um, I am a cognitive psychologist, and that means I'm interested in how we think broadly what we do, how we think. I'm particularly interested in how we come to know things that we don't already know. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. How do we know what we don't know? How do we even know? It goes right back to Mino's paradox. It goes back, you know, miles, miles, ancient time. How do we know what we don't already know? Um, how does this process unfold? And how is this new knowledge generated? How is this new knowledge generated in our minds? I have an underlying theoretical position, which is not mainstream cognitive psychology, although it's not as unmainstream as people maybe suggest it is, which is that the way that this knowledge is generated, the way we know new stuff, is by doing things in the environment, by doing things in consult with other people. That actually new knowledge doesn't really get generated by recycling the same ideas over and over in our head, instead we have to move outside of our heads and look at what happens in our interactions with the environment. Um, and so I think that really the role of the environment is under considered in everything that we do in cognitive psychology. Um, I am co-chair of the Serendipity Society, and I have recently the Art of Serendipity, which is a wonderful collection. I recently co-edited that with my other chair, um, Samantha Copeland, and I do some work on possibility with GLAD. So that's me. This is, um, I quite like to start my talks with this. This is a, a excerpt from a book called The Art of Thinking by, by um, Herbert Simon. And he says this, we watch an ant make his laborious way across a wind and wave molded beach. He moves ahead, angles to the right to ease his climb up a steep junglet, to talk detours around a pebble, stops for a moment to exchange information with a compatriot. And thus he makes his weaving, halting way back to his home. He has a general sense of where home lies, but he cannot foresee all the obstacles in between. He must adapt his course repeatedly to the difficulties he encounters and often detour uncrossable barriers. His horizons are very close so that he deals with each obstacle as he comes to it. He probes the way around it or over it without much thought for future obstacles. It is very easy to trap him into deep detours. Now, this has given us an example of why it will always be impossible for cognitive psychologists to take the environment into thinking. That we need to reduce the environment out of what we're doing because it's impossible to predict that ant's trajectory based on the uncertainty of the environment in which they're in. And yet, that's kind of the way we live our lives, right? If we try to take the ant and their trajectory out of that meandering environment with all its dangers, all its detours, with all its different things, its unpredictability, 
then we're creating a sort of form of human thinking which doesn't mimic the way that we really navigate the world. And what's happened really is that currently the way we look at creative thoughts, I think has benefited massively from a, this very productive research program looking at ideation, looking at that mind separated from the environment, putting us in a smaller, reduced sphere. But, well, something seems to come up on that and not anywhere else. Um, it's always considered to be brain-based. So what we tend to do when we're looking at how people create things is we how people generate ideas. And we assume that they sit there and they effortfully think, okay? An effortful thought. Thoughtfulness is implied to happen here inside the head. Um, I'm not really too sure that that fits with a lot of anecdotal stuff that we do. I'm not gonna read all of this for you, but this is from the way that James Watson realized that he, the, the formation of double helix. I'm not gonna read all of it to you mainly because I can't say half the words. But what he basically did was he got bits of cardboard and he played with them at his desk. And as he played with them at his desk, he fitted them together. Some of them fitted together, some of them didn't fit together. And then all of a sudden he says, I became aware that this pair was the key. So if you're interested as I am in how people become aware in how people generate new knowledge and new awareness, then to look at how people say they do that and to take out the environment, to take out those things we play with, to take out all those things, these are gonna necessarily miss quite a large part of the story. And my aunt's trajectory will just be a straight line from the sea back to his home. But that's not a straight line that any of us take because we're always situated in that environment. And so there's all these aspects here of creative thinking that I think are important. I think what happens inside our head is desperately important. I think what happens when we work in groups is desperately important. I think that the way that the world scaffolds our lives is desperately important. All these three are already being researched. There's a really, really prolific research area in all of these things. And some wonderful people doing some wonderful thinking. There's much less work in this. Not how we use the world to scaffold our thoughts, not how we think in groups, not how we think inside our head, but how we actually can give agency, how the world can generate our thoughts for us, can generate our thinking for us. Oops. And we have to then step outside of psychology and look at work from people in ethnography or anthropology. And um, this is from a cognitive archaeologist, um, Lambros Malaforis. And he's very clear that actually, when you talk about creative processes, you're not talking anymore about people thinking in their minds effortfully. You're not thinking about people sitting down and thinking, how am I gonna make that thing? And creating an image in their mind and manipulating it in their mind. Rather, actually what's happening is that materials and objects become part of the creativity, that the thinking happens with the hands, that the hands do the thinking, the hands do the creating, the hands do the making. So much so that Malaforis has that notion of thinking, which I am, sorry, Lambros, if you're listening, I doubt you are. I think it's a slightly ugly way of putting it, but it comes from a Heideggerian sort of idea. But in his mind, things actively participate in human cognitive life. So the things become really important and they become cognitive. They do the, the thinking for you. So thinking is how we think with interaction with things. Um, what this means, though, is we have to take quite, I think, quite an uncomfortable step. Because if we're really going to take the external world seriously, we have to relinquish some agency. We have to say things are no longer under our control. We have to say that actually how creative I am from one day to the next isn't actually fixed. You're not a creative person or a non-creative person. You can't, you don't, you don't have, you have to accept that there's accidents. There are things that happen which are outside of your control. And that can be something that's quite tricky to do. It's also quite tricky for us to research. Um, but I think it happens. So this is an anecdote of Vera Rubin. Um, Vera Rubin is a wonderful astronomer and she discovered, now I'm not 100% sure I understand exactly what she discovered, but it was about rotating spectral galaxies. I mean, I know I know all of science, but I know all of science, but as you may have noticed, there's two big scientific discoveries I can't, don't actually understand entirely. But aside from that, all other science, I'm an expert on. And there are these two rotating spectral galaxies. And what happened was she happened to be 
playing with some pictures. And she noticed, very much like that Watson story, that these galaxies were rotating in a way that they shouldn't rotate according to the laws of physics, which I don't understand, which then allowed her to generate a whole set of other things. You have to trust me on this. This is just truth. This is facts, okay? Now, what happened was she couldn't have done this 10, 15 years earlier because the images of the galaxies weren't clear enough. But equally, she couldn't have done it. If she, I couldn't have done it, you could give me as many beautiful spectral pictures as possible. I had no idea what I'm looking at. So she also needs to know what she was looking at. She needs to know what was happening. And this, although we hear all the time from all sorts of people, this is from a, this is Chitsi Mahali created a large series of interviews with 100 creative people. And what he said, what he drew out of from 100 really eminent creative people was that luck was the most um, frequent reason for why they explain their success. Luck. Now, if we go back to Vera Rubin, I'd argue that wasn't luck. I'd argue that luck played a role in it, but actually luck has to be coupled with skill. Um, so when we talk, when you go back and you pick into this a little bit, being in the right place at the right time is an almost universal explanation for creative success. But that's not an unskilled thing to do. I'm, well, maybe I'm just never in the right place at the right time, but I suspect if I've been, if I, if it, I would use the country musical, none of you have heard me sing, there's a good reason for that. It wouldn't matter what the right space was, what the right time was, I would never become a wonderful singer. It's just not what I do. And what happens is, is that when we start to look at some of the work we do on serendipity, we can see that um, we have these broader social things that come into play. And we also have these personal things. And the two of them need to meet and work for us to be able to identify and understand serendipity. But I've jumped a little bit ahead, that slide is actually in the wrong place. So you'll have to remember that, keep it in mind, and then we'll come back to it later. Um, and what we find is, and this is from some work that Vlad's done, is that that minor, this trigger point, that's why I had that slide there, this trigger point, this pivot event, doesn't actually have to be anything very big. The trigger event, the pivot event for serendipity can be something really quite small. And in these particular people, they talked about, um, so Vlad did some research, he interviewed creative people across five different creative domains and, and the notion of accidents came up loads and loads, right? So designers said that their creative activity was a game of happy accidents. Um, accidents were a role in the process for artists and they were artistically interesting to have. Um, objects very often changed the original plan. They were stronger than the creator, imposing their rules. So as you start to talk to creative people, luck, accidents, being in the right place at the right time, these all become expiratory factors for how they generated new ideas, how, how they became creative. And in fact, this goes even beyond, but essentially, any time there is an ethnographic or an interview study of creative people, I've yet to find one where they haven't mentioned accidents or luck. Okay, so this has to be something that we need to take seriously, but I would keep returning back to that example of Vera Rubin. It wasn't just luck. It can't be just luck. And so what it is, is, well, I argue it's this thing called serendipity. I'm going to do a little detour now, I'm going to slow down a little bit because I've probably been talking to you and get a glass of water. So I'm about to take you on a fairy tale and a fairy tale of what serendipity is. Um, lots of people recognize the word serendipity. If you are a serendipity researcher, you get bought loads of mugs with the word serendipity on it. Usually lots of posters as well. And usually the posters have somebody at sunset looking really serene because unfortunately serendipity and serenity are so close that they've become a little bit mingled in people's minds. You also get to find out how people met their partner all the time. It takes about 30 seconds from meeting someone. They say, what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm interested in serendipity. And they say, ah, when I met my partner, it was really serendipitous. Or I'm currently going through a divorce and it was really unlucky when I met my partner and I wish I hadn't. So depending on which point you happen to be meeting that person, they're meeting their partner will either be serendipitous or not. And serendipity is a funny word. It was invented by Horace Walpole in a letter from 1754. And he was talking about spotting 
distinction between two things. And he discussed the fairy tales of three princes of Serendip. And in the fairy tale, the three princes of Serendip, the three princes set out on their travels. And as they did, they noticed things on the way. They noticed a bit of chewed grass here, a little bit of bees here, um, a few different bits and pieces here. Kept on walking, kept on walking. And then they got arrested by the king of Persia. And they said, oh, you know, but you've, you've stolen my camel. And he said, well, actually, no, I didn't steal a camel. We know we didn't steal a camel because I can tell you this, 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 and this. And this will show you we didn't. And the king of Persia followed up what they said and it turned out to be true. So they had spotted these small things on the way on their journey. They didn't know they were going to be useful. They then used them to persuade their way out of it. And because they were the princes of Serendip, Paul we'll called it serendipity. And so he said this word serendipity just means making discoveries by accident sagacity of things which we are not in quest of. And what this gives us, I suggest, is a way to go back. We go back to Vera Rubin's as fast as we can, bosh, 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 back to Vera Rubin's discovery. Okay, it was an accident she made that discovery. She wasn't in quest of it. She couldn't have been, right? because it was something new. We can't actually be in quest, and this is the whole paradoxical situation of uncovering new knowledge. You can't say, right, there's something I don't know, so I'm gonna set out to find the thing that I don't know, because the second you don't know, you don't know it, then you know it enough to know what it is, right? So she was not in quest, she, wasn't, she was not looking for this, she wasn't in quest of this thing. But equally, I need to get back to where I was, slowly, slowly, slowly. Equally, she had to have sagacity. She had to suffer some wisdom in order to recognize what it was, in order to understand what it was, because you could give, I'm just gonna guess, I could give these things to anybody in this audience and they probably wouldn't go, wow, I've changed the future or the direction of astronomy, right? So actually, serendipity allows us to say there are accidents in our lives. There are things that generate knowledge for us, but, those things are also reliant on our sagacity. So it becomes an emergent thing from both of these aspects. And there is plenty of anecdotal evidence for the existence of serendipity in research. I mean, this is Alexander Fleming, for example. So he's probably the most famous, and we'll see a little bit in a, little, in a couple of slides time exactly why, what happened to generate a serendipity, but he discovered penicillin. I don't know if you know the story. Um, he um, came up so, I mean, the story is actually fantastic because he went away for Christmas. Because he went, when he went away for Christmas, it was unseasonably warm. Hadn't been that warm for years before, wasn't, probably will now be that warm because of global warming, but wasn't that warm for years after. Because it was warm, his dirty Petri dish started to grow something. Wouldn't have done if it was a little bit colder as it should have been. At the same time, his lab was situated above an asthma lab and some spores floated up from the asthma lab and landed on the Petri dish. Alexander Fleming had a look at the Petri, came back from Christmas, had a look at the mouldy Petri dish, didn't just do what we would do, go, oh, but actually went, oh, that's interesting, there's mould there. And he used to do that all the time, apparently. Um, and from there, developed penicillin. Okay, so that's the, an accident, which was then exploited by somebody that had the sagacity to do so. And in fact, um, there's some suggestions. So this is a 1996 paper. They went through all the top 400 most cited papers in the recent history of science. And of these 17 of the 400, so 8.3%, um, cited serendipity as, as a reason for part, part of the research. And I've just been given a report by Salvier, which says that about 17 to 20% of researchers in their recent survey says serendipity is responsible for the scientific discovery. So for somebody that's interested in how people come up with new ideas, how people invent things, or serendipity, it may be between 10 and 20% of the reasons why we do it. It's important, we have to do it. So how can we generate more serendipity? Because I think that's what I promised I'd tell you in the abstract. So now you've got some sense of why I think is important, some sense of what it might be. Well, first of all, you can have more serendipitous environments. And most, a lot of the work that's been done on this is by somebody called Leonard Bjornborn. Um, he's fantastic and wonderful. And if you are ever interested in this, I definitely suggest you um, speak to him. And he's basically suggested that what we need to do for our environments is that we need to have, we can have three key affordances. And the affordances here are the things that will generate, will help us to understand serendipity. 
you have to have diversive diversifiability. So your environments have to be able to do many things. The one thing can play many roles, can do many different things. Part of that is incompleteness. If you have a fully closed system, then your space for serendipity, your space for accidents, if things are too under control, there's not the possibility for that environment to generate the accidents. Your environments have to be traversable. So they have to be, they have to have a level of traversability. You should be able to move around them, move them as well, right? Because if you're doing that, you're generating space for accidents, you're generating these things. They have to be explorable. They also have to have frictionality. Okay, something to rub up against, something to stop. Too much flow means you're less likely to have serendipity. He also suggests they have to be sensor, they have to have sensorability. In other words, they have to be sort of physically attractive. You have to want to touch them, to play with them. They have to have contrast. They have to show us how we can do things, moving towards things. These sorts of environments, the sorts of environments that are more likely to generate those accidents, those accidents that we notice, that then go on to generate serendipity. And we want them, right? One of the big debates over the last two years, certainly within my field, has been, well, as we move to a more online world, and even though things are, look like they're getting back to whatever normal is, our normal now is a lot more online, right? Our normal now is a lot less, looks a lot less like that. It looks a lot more complete. The phone goes down on a Zoom call, we end the call. That sort of incompleteness where you walk out and you talk to different people, that's gone, right? The same with, um, same with traversability, you can't move around a room, you can't talk to the same people. Those sort of movement things have gone as well. The mobility part has gone. And the sensorability, actually, we're losing an awful lot just by being with people. We're tired. Zoom makes us tired. We don't quite interact with people in the same way. And this environment seems to be quite important. And people have put things in place. And the, the debate is ongoing. And I did consider even just talking about the debate today on whether or not the pandemic and the online world has reduced serendipity. I think you would find people that would argue really strongly in, in um, terms of both. And I'm happy to talk about it afterwards if people are interested. But certainly, when you see these things taken away, when you see the natural way that we have structured our environments, because we have naturally structured our environments to increase moments where we talk to each other, increase moments where we meet, increase moments where things are nice. When your environment is forcibly restructured into something different at a high speed, then it makes you realize what you've lost. It makes us realize how important these environments are to our innovation, to our thinking and to our well-being. You also need networks build serendipity. Now, much of my thinking on networks is influenced by Samantha Copeland, who does a lot of work on serendipitous networks. And she talks about the networks that were needed for that penicillin invention. You know, the one I talked about with Blenny a little while ago. And so we have this. This is our moldy Petri dish, um, contaminated by spores from the asthma lab, but asthma, and not asthma, I don't know what asthma is, asthma lab below over an unusually warm Christmas break. That was our key triggering event. The story of penicillin really doesn't stop there. Okay, so Fleming noticed it. He went, oh, look, there's some mold there. And he spoke to somebody. He spoke to his assistant, Hunt. And Hunt said, oh, we should look at that. So straight away, the knowledge was distributed between people. It's very hard to take the risk of following up serendipitous accidents on your own. Because it is a risk. Because most accidents aren't really going to end up in anything other than an accident. Most mouldy, unfortunately, most mouldy petri dishes are just mould and need to be washed up. So you need to have somebody with you to help you do that. Now, once they did that, they didn't actually know what it was they were dealing with. And in fact, if you look at Fleming's Nobel Prize acceptance speech, he says he didn't really deserve to get this. So he, that accident happened in his lab. So what they did is they sent samples around to other labs and they published it in a scientific journal. It lay quiet and dormant for about 10 to 15 years. And then Florian Chain in Oxford, they, co-winners of the Nobel Prize, they picked it up. Okay, they said, actually, we know what this is now. Now our scientific knowledge has moved on so far. We know what this is. We're going to go with this. All these people were a Nobel Prize. We wouldn't have penicillin now if it wasn't for someone called Mary Hunt. So 
So Mary Hunt, who's only really known as Moldy Mary in the story, she's not Hunt the assistant, they just, obviously Fleming just liked the word Hunt just to, just to make my life more tricky. Um, they needed to be able to cultivate penicillin on a massive scale. And she was walking through her market space, and it's just, it's just a serendipitous story. And she saw a cantaloupe melon with exactly the right sort of mould that was needed. So it was an accident, because there's a mouldy melon in the marketplace. It was sagacity, because she could recognise that type of mould. She didn't just go, oh, it was a mouldy melon. And she took it back. And because of that, because it was so cheap, they were able to manufacture penicillin in really large amounts. And exactly just before the US government was about to go and do the D-Day landings. So the US government was very aware they needed to have something to make this safer. Had she discovered it a little bit later, it would, no one would have really cared so much. Had she discovered it sooner, it might not have had such military investment. Instead, she discovered this mold right at the right time. She recognized it. And all of these things were needed for penicillin to be as ubiquitous as it is today. So to point back to that one moment of discovery from Alexander Fleming isn't really quite fair. It's not a good way to describe the discovery process. We also have some different typologies of people that can experience serendipity. So a lot of work on this has been done by two, two excellent researchers, Stefan Macri and um, Sandra Erdele, who we'll talk about in a second. And Stefan has spent a lot of time looking at creative people and how they generate serendipity. And in line with everything I've said, all the creative people that he sees are all keen to talk about serendipity. They all view serendipity as part of their process. And what he decided, what he saw that creative people, they basically do almost exactly the stuff that Leonard was talking about. They vary their routines, they move around so they can see different things, they can get inspiration from different things, from different spaces. They're observant, so they look all around them, they can notice things. And as we will see, there's not much point in something accidental happening if you don't notice it. Um, they make mental space. They relax their boundaries. That openness is really important. They're not being closed off. They also then, they start to see the value by drawing on previous experience. Okay, your, that sagacity, that learning, your prior knowledge is really, really important for making the most of an accident. And so it's not just, well, it's not just accidental thinking. It's thinking, it's prior knowledge that's all there. They're able to look for patterns. They're able to see patterns. And then they go on to seize the opportunity. So in another, in another um, time I've written about this, I've called serendipity inactive luck. So it's luck, but it's luck that has to be acted upon. It has to be drawn. It has to be used. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's just inert. Um, Sandra Erdeles has spent a lot of time looking at people who do um, information encountering. So she works in information seeking, how we get the information we need, and she talks about information encounters. And information encountering is when you stumble across something without planning. So it's, one of, it's very, very close to serendipity. And she identified four types of information encounters. Non-encounters. Now, your non-encounters are people that never, ever find anything by accident. They search for something, that's the thing they search for. They don't get distracted by whatever adverts down there, whatever the second or third thing down on the Google search was. They know what they want, they go for it. Occasional encounters are very similar. They might occasionally admit to coming across things accidentally, but most of the time not. Um, encounterers are kind of probably like the rest of us, occasionally see things accidentally, but again, they're still quite targeted in their search. And then we have super encounterers. Now, if you ever find a super encounterer, you want to keep them in your life forever. Okay, we can maybe go back to that how you met your partner story. You'll go, well, there was this person at Webster, she gave this talk about super encounterers. I went out and I found one, and now she's in my life forever. Um, super encounterers are fantastic. All right, they just have a wider appreciation of information and they really value coming across things by accident as a method. There is an intention to it. Just like our artists make it an intention, just like our artists decide to encounter serendipity, super encounterers are the people that go, yeah, I've got half an hour. I'm gonna do the random page on Wikipedia and see what I can find out because they just wanna do it. They don't need to know why they know, they just want to know. They form networks all the time. 
So super encounterers will see the world in networks. This is like this, this idea is linked to this idea, which is linked to this idea. Um, and also, and this is why you want to keep them, super encounterers share their information all the time. If you are a serendipity researcher, by the way, what that means is all your friends know this is a good thing to do. And every time you open up your email, there are 5,000 emails from people going, I've just seen this and I thought of you. I've just seen this and I thought of you, because they all know that's the trick to doing it, because they're all super encounters. Um, but that's great. So if you have a, your super encounter will be the person that says, I saw this and I thought of you. Your super encounter will be the person that sees the connection between you and that, oh, you're looking for a job, but I know that person over there. They, they're, they're looking for someone that will hire you. Those people are your super encounters. So they come across information, they seek information, but really importantly, they make networks and connections between those information. Now, I touched on this a little bit in the misplaced slide, so I'll come back to it now. There's one problem in the way that we're researching serendipity at the moment, and at least I think it's a problem. And that there's two ways we study serendipity. Um, Stefan and Sander, they do semi-structured interviews. So they ask people, you know, serendipity. How do you do it? What do you do? Um, people like Peck Van Andel, people like Ohi Jacob, they collect reports on serendipity. They go out and they find things, you know, come and find your serendipity. Um, there are currently no, it's half of one, models that draw their evidence from experimental designs or observations in situ. So everything is about the interpretation of the person's experience serendipity. This can lead to massive confounds because we may no longer be looking at serendipity, instead of looking at a sense of serendipity. So instead of saying, actually, is somebody lucky or serendipitous? Are these characteristics going to generate serendipity? What we're going to say is, actually, do you know what? The sort of person that likes making connections, that likes making networks, that's friendly, that sees loads of people, they also think they're really lucky. But that's not telling us anything about luck. That's not telling us anything about serendipity. That's just telling us that there's a certain personality type that looks like that. And it's not a surprising one, is it? It's not really surprising that people that make more connections also feel luckier. If we think that openness to the world leads to serendipity, or is it just people that are open to the world and more like to recognize it as that way? And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to become more systematic in how we look at serendipity. And this is a work in progress. Um, feel free to come and tell me um, what, how I should progress it one way or the other. And rather than saying what happens afterwards, so rather than this part here, this value judgment, this thing that happened to me is serendipitous, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to see what might happen here and here and here. Because what can happen is we're in a certain state of mind when we encounter new information. Because we encounter new information all the time. Because when we walk down a street, every person in there, their lives are full of other things. When we talk to somebody at a bar, that could be the person that's the key to the rest of our lives. But if we thought every person was the key to the rest of our lives, then we just spend our entire time at bars. Ah, that might be one, that might be one I've been going wrong. And you can't do that. As, as actually Vlad wrote um, in his chapter in our book, you can't be prepared or your mind cannot be open or prepared to everything or we'd never get anywhere, right? So you have to have a certain mental state at the point when you encounter information, which currently I've characterized as being in a flow state, being at one with the world, being kind of happy and moving forward. Um, being ignorant, so not knowing, not knowing what you don't know, um, or being frustrated. So when you know there's something that you've got to find the answer to that you can't quite find it. I have a colleague called Selena Arthini who calls this aching ignorance, that real desire to know what's going on. And then something happens, an event, an accident, um, which changes you. Everything changes our knowledge state that happens to us. Sometimes these are massive changes. I'm hoping that you'll leave this room going, I had a massive change to my knowledge state. And um, sometimes they're smaller ones. Again, I'm hoping you're not leaving me like that, but I suspect it might be. And when that happens, you have a choice. You can just respond to it and then carry on. You can discard it 
not look at it, not use it. You can either discard it forever, or you can discard it and sort of stick it up. I might find that useful at some point, I'll write a note to it. Um, or you can enact it, you can use it. Now, if you use it, you then might have a new discovery, a new solution, which you then might think is really important. If you do either of these two, we won't know about it, right? If you then come across that information and you don't use it and you don't do anything with it, then we won't know anything about it. The same if you just decide to move on from it. Oh, that's nice. If you just move on from it again, we won't know anything about it. What this means is if I want to talk about which one of these states the person states, or what type of event is necessary. If you want to ask me what will increase my chance of serendipity, I can't tell you because I could say this state might, this state might, but I've got no idea about the number of people that discard. I've got no idea about the number of people that just respond. So what we actually need to do is we need to start thinking, well, so what I'm trying to do is trying to start thinking about what might be a serendipitous state. So which one of these is the best way for you to start having your mind prepared to take on that new information and to use that new information? Um, and we have some, finally, if we think about it this way, we can tip across some evidence out there. And that comes from the realm of insight problem solving. So insight problems are problems where you can't work out the right answer directly. So an insight problem is one where as soon as you see the right answer, you know it, but you didn't know it before. A puzzle or a crossword. Say, for example, um, let's think of a riddle. I should really have had a better example on it. So if you have the example that in Romania, <laughs> a, a, photographer, a photographer can't take a photo of anyone with a suit and tie. How can that be so? Okay, so you sit there for a while and you think, well, is there, is there a law in Romania that means you can't take photos of people with a suit and tie? And you sort of think, and, and, and it's a trick, right? Because it triggers your memory and you go, well, I'm sure Romania was under communist occupation. They might have some sort of some very strange rules like that. And at some point, you go, ah, let me just reevaluate that sentence semantically. Actually, I can't take a photo of anyone with a suit and tie. I need a camera. <laughs> Suits and ties don't take photographs. And then you go, oh, yes. And hopefully you do what Vlad did. You love an aha. And your brain goes, oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, the answer's obvious. It was always there. All the information you needed was for it. But, um, but you just didn't get it, right? So you can't work it out step by step in that way. Instead, it sort of comes to you. And what it appears is you would think that being given hints to the answer, so what I like to think of as being controlled accidents, you would think that would help you solve it. It really doesn't. In fact, if you put people in these situations, they tend not to be able to pick up on the hints. The only times we know when they pick up on the hints are when they really hit a real blockage, when they hit that aching ignorance, which gives us some sense that maybe I, need to, I don't need to go forward because I put it in here. No, oh, no I didn't. <laughs> this is a well-rehearsed set of slides, as you can see. <laughs> Which gives us some sense that basically, if you are in the middle of your problem solving flow, we can throw as many hints at you as possible. We can give you the answer, and I've seen this in some work I've done with anagrams. You can give people the answer and they are not interested. Okay, they are too engaged in what they're doing to take any notice. So, extreme flow state is really bad for serendipity. If they've got no idea what they're doing, again, they don't really take notice. Instead, what they need to do is be frustrated. They need to hit blockages. They need to hit the ways that they can move forward. And then all of a sudden they go, okay, well, what else is there? I've run out of my own internal resources. What else is there? What else can I find? And this then means we need to move beyond what we, what we would think about as a way of looking at the world and a way of looking at cognition. So instead of saying that we are scaffolded or structured by the external world, we actually need to move to a position of active externalism, 
which suggests that the external world is part of the cognitive ecosystem. It's not the whole cognitive ecosystem, we are part of that as well. So we think things with our brain, but at some point we start to seek outwards. And when we start to seek outwards, then what happens is we start to get those ideas from the environment, but it doesn't happen all the time. Any sort of experimental studies on hints and insight find it very hard to make hints work. So again, a lot more, a lot more research is needed on this. Um, under most models of externalism, the agent recruits and selects and thinks about the world. But when it comes to creativity, when it comes to insight, you don't know what to create and recruit. You don't know. When it comes to finding new knowledge, you can't say, I'm going to go and find the external world and I'm going to find the knowledge I have. We're right back to what I said at the start. So again, you just have to go back to this thinking, this event, this interruption. So if we know that we've got something in this state, the next thing to do is to start to think about this state. What is it that comes into, what is it that impinges on us? What is it that takes us there? Now, I think at the moment, but you can have me back in two years, lad, and I might have changed my mind. I changed my mind all the time. I think two years ago I said something different. Um, I think at the moment that the accident is actually not that important, which is actually not what I argued in the book that's there. So I wouldn't read my chapter in the book, you know it's outdated already. Um, I, there you go. I think that the accident is not actually the most important. Um, I think the cognitive state is the most important to understanding how you make the most of changing environment. How we wander through a world that is uncertain, that is constantly full of accidents. What is it that makes us make the most of them? What is it that makes us turn them into a scientific discovery? Um, I also think, and this is from the book, from having edited all the chapters in the book, that serendipity is also a pre-mastery stage of creativity. It involves disjunction and lack of flow. If you look at studies of inspiration, if you think and look at those creators that are there, they don't go out on walks when they're painting and when they know what they're doing. They go out for walks and look for inspiration when we're stuck. If we're in the middle of doing something, if we're feeling really creative, we don't go, right, okay, so I've got that, now I'm gonna go and find some inspiration. That's not how it works. So actually serendipity sits in this strange spot where you have to have skills, but you're also stuck and you're also pre mastering you're beyond the sense of blood. And so actually disruption, breaking people out of their comfort zone seems to be the most important thing to me about the experience of serendipity. Um, and that's it really. I have no idea whether I've gone over or under time. I always promise that I would get perfect time. A perfect time. Minutes. Fantastic. There we go. And um, so thank you everybody for listening. These are some of the people that have um, been incredibly helpful as I think through these ideas. And yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you so much for your thoughts. It's amazing. Um, any questions from the room or online? I guess we can put the, the chat up if um, just to see if there are any questions in the chat. Someone said still good. Oh, no, it's about the sound. <laughs> yeah, <I think> so. <laughs> it's still good. Um, <laughs> no, it's gone rubbish. So any, any, any questions from the room? I, I have loads of questions, but I know that I talk more often to you. Yeah. yeah, great, great talk, Wendy. Thank you very much. Um, you talked a lot about personal serendipity. Um, imagine you are the mayor of a city, president of a university, of a think tank. How would you, what would you recommend in terms of fostering um, you know, a, a greater cognitive state. So in other words, after you write book number two, how, what would you recommend for the powers that be uh, at all different levels? Um, if the, if the uh, cognitive state is that important, how do you foster it? How do you promote it? How do you spread it? Yeah, how do you make people feel stuck and uncomfortable? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you made me feel stuck. It's funny, actually, I was asked that um, just recently. And so I will give an answer that maybe doesn't um, fit with what I've said here, but I still think is important um, because there's a psychological safety that's required in serendipity. So my biggest piece of advice to organisations is to create a psychological safe space. Yeah, and, and a safe for failure and actually to make failures mean things. So, so accidents are failures. Right, accidents are, they're disruptive. I think it's really important that we move away from the image of serendipity as being the person on the beach because it sounds so much like serenity there with the moonlight. No, 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 accidents are disruptive and they're risky. 
for the really, really good things to happen, you have to take that big risk. Something comes into your life that you were not expecting. You probably, it disrupts your flow. You probably didn't even really want it there necessarily. And you have to take the risk to follow it up. And there's a really interesting paper um, all the way back from the 1950s called The Case of the Floppy-Eared Rabbits. And it's two scientists that spotted the same thing. They, another bit of science, even though I'm a science expert, I know all of science, I don't know this. I told you. But, it, but essentially, um, if you, they used to test a heart thing. I skipped this part of most of the papers. They used to test a heart thing on rabbits. And for the, for the rabbits to be sensitive to it, you had to inject their ears with palpate. And you'd know when their ears went floppy if they'd been injected by enough. But it didn't actually quite make sense. I know it's a very strange story. It didn't actually quite make sense. Their ears shouldn't have gone floppy. And eventually, two scientists at the same time made the same observation. So their ears went floppy with a certain amount, but it didn't make sense because it switched. One of them had the resources and the time and the mental space to follow it up. The other one didn't. The subsequent discoveries were apparently really important to rabbit ear studies. Um, I don't really remember them all. But the point is, is that you can have that discovery, that accident. You need to be in the state to recognize it. But from an organizational perspective, it's not really about creating that state. It's about creating the safety to follow it up. And coming out of failure, you can also learn a lot, lot if you're therefore allowed to fail, if your organization allows you to fail. Is that helpful? It's not quite what you are, but it's, it's the other side, really. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, following up on how you answered that, do you think that our modern society is ready to take that many risks, make that many mistakes in order to make these discoveries? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I think that I think there's always, uh, and Samantha talks a lot about this, a level of privilege that's attached to the serendipitous stories and to the ability to do these things. Um, so I think that to be able to be serendipitous requires privilege. It requires a massive amount of privilege. You have to be able to take risks. So if you look at serendipity in organizations, um, it's very hard for small organizations to, so it's very hard for large organizations to experience true serendipity because things are too fixed. They're too rigid, they're too hierarchical. It's also very hard for small organizations to experience serendipity because the risks it takes to follow it up if they don't have the capital. So actually some of the work I'm doing with um, an organizational psychologist on serendipity, we're looking at this Goldilocks zone. When you're small enough to be flexible and nimble and respond, but you are still large enough to absorb risks because not every accident will be successful. Most petri dishes will just be molding. And a lot of the stories of serendipity really are these gentlemen scientists who had all the time in the world that could fiddle around with things. And I don't know whether we have that luxury anymore. And it's very hard from an ethical perspective to say, well, we should allow that luxury. We should allow some people to take big risks with all of our money in the hope of making this great big leap and this great big play. So I think it's important. I think it needs to be understood, but I think it really, really is linked to privilege. I remember we had that talk, when we had that talk um, last year at Creativity Week about the Brazilian children, and one of them, was it the Monica. fifth? There was, yes, and she said that she was talking to 15 year old Brazilian street children about being creative. And they were just like, what are you, you know, it just didn't, the idea of creativity when they were struggling to live from hand to mouth. Having said that, there is some work by Christian Bush on um, serendipity entrepreneurs in various places in Africa, which is really, really interesting, and the Sandbox Initiative. So yeah, I, so I think those are, those are the sort of the things you need to talk about when you think about how society is structured for serendipity, how society is structured to allow the privilege of failure across different people. Here is where I'll have a small comment and then Tom has a question online, but I'll, I'll you know, it's very interesting, you know, we, I tend to think, I think many of us do exactly that balance between what happens in the world and where your mind is at in terms of the problems it deals with and the openness to be perceptive to the link, to the unexpected link with what happens. But then we're talking here about making something of that connection, because you can spot a connection, but not have energy, time, the privilege to spend and it just dies off. So serendipity in a way is enacted when a lot of other things happen. And I was wondering about the role of emotion in all of that, you know, all these emotions that support you. There is the part about privilege, institutional, and but what do people talk about emotions associated with serendipity 
Like, do you need a level of excitement about what you found? Could, could that be so? Something? So it has to. Yeah. So in conceptually, it has to be happy. Okay. <laughs> so conceptually, serendipity has to be a positive and a fortuitous thing. Otherwise, it's zemblanity. We like our words, right? <laughs> Otherwise, it's zemblanity. That's when something happens. Zemblanity. Yes. Zemblanity. Zemblanity is when something. You know, it's the opposite of serendipity. It's a bad thing that happens. Um, but the right at the right time and moment. Yeah, it's just terrible. <laughs> it's <a> perfect storm. <laughs> and it's very, but of course, that in itself is um, is depends on your perspective in your in the timeline. There are lots of things that seem non serendipitous. They become serendipitous yeah. all the way around. Um, in terms of that, so I think that so personally, I think that the emotion is really important in that frustration side. So that's right. some of the work that I'm doing at the moment in investigating that state is when you hit that wall, when you're frustrated, do you carry on seeking or do you give up? And I think if you give up, then that's, you know, you won't be able to, it will be much harder to have that disruption. Yeah. Thanks. Tom said if you, uh, come here and read it with me. Uh, legend, different parts of your model of creativity, which one would have the biggest impact on the resulting creative outcome? Do you mean the, 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 this, this model? Tom? Yeah, probably the, the, the big model. The big model. Which, which one is most, you have to choose your favorite. I have to choose my favorite. I can't choose my favorite <laughs> because I think that's bad. Um, I don't know about creativity, Tom, but I will actually give, retract what I said um already already because i never say the same because the other openness is very serendipitous um for it to be serendipity it has to have an accident and actually this is really important um because otherwise you're just talking about discovery and sometimes serendipitous nar narratives collapse into narratives of discovery right again we all have to be a bit stuck on a problem to find out something new we all have then has it has to be followed up we all have, to have privilege to follow these things up for it to be serendipitous it has to have an accident so the accident is important to it conceptually serendipitous um in terms of creativity i actually think um this one's the most important the Thank value you. judgment you know, i appreciate that i, mean, I, I hear you agree. i hear you agree so something is either whether something's creative or not really depends on the value judgment at the end and that value judgment can be personal it can be historical it can be cultural but that's what makes it creative i think again that's, that's what i believe as well so it must be true um do we have a second comment i think yes tom agrees um or he likes because a place for thought here we are that's yes. our that's what we're creating here any any other things tom any other questions from anyone in the room we have a, a unique chance to have wendy here yes yeah Regarding the cognitive state, psychologically safe receptor, um, is it also has your research shown that it's also important um, that uh, people are in a state of letting go the knowledge they already have, uh, just in a state of forgetting what they already know as uh, as an openness to actually discovering something new. Um, so actually, no, and it's probably Tom would actually better to talk about that than me. Um, I I think in I in I I think the ability to be flexible and to repurpose that knowledge, but I think forgetting your knowledge will put you in a state of non sagacity, for a better way of putting it. So if you look at the serendipitous stories, you need to have a great deal of knowledge to understand stuff. You need to have a great deal of skill. I think there's um there's a really I think it's a harmful, but I know it's a pernicious, and I'm going to use the word pernicious, so harmful, same thing, um, narrative that creativity or discovery is about lack of constraints, about wandering through, you know, the, the romantic idea that you see all these things around you, you forget things. I don't think that maps onto actually what the creative and the, the creative process is hard work and knowledge and skills. And so I think keeping hold of those knowledge, being able to reapply them flexibly. I think is really important to be able to repurpose that knowledge and those memory things that you have. But actually, I think it is still really important to have those things. Final thoughts? Yeah, no problem. No, no, go ahead. As our society is moving into more like individualistic um, type of thinking about ourselves, about our society, um, are we going to be sacrificing serendipity? So okay, so 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 this is this this 
1995 was the first article, the, the end of serendipity. Um, and so that always feels like that's so that was like five years ago. Oh no, it wasn't, was it? It was almost 20 years ago. Um, I think, I think not. And the reason I think not is because I think it's an in inherent part of the human condition, number one. Um, I, I, I think I think it's the way we make new knowledge. I think it's I think it's the way we make the greatest leaps forward, and I think that's part of what we actually do. That sounds really big and grandiose claim for somebody that just watches people solve anagrams, but I think it's part, I think it's part of what we do: interacting with uncertainty, making the most of the accidents, making the most of things that come that way. So I don't think we are. I think there's risks in the digital world and the image digital world and the image individualistic world. I think there's an interesting um, situation that we have now, we have increased and decreased happening quite often. One missed the time change. Yeah. yeah. Um, it'd be an increase and decrease things happening. So in mixing, so if you think about um, cross-cultural travel, for example, we've just been thinking about it, haven't we? We are now mixing much more cross-culturally in many ways than we ever have before because we can talk to people all over the world, but we're actually traveling less maybe and in absorbing ourselves in their societies less. Um, I think, so um, Zoom's really interesting and I've thought a lot about Zoom. So one thing that makes Zoom really difficult is all sorts of sort of anonymity, things like that, but also Zoom flattens all our hierarchies. We flatten our hierarchies on Zoom. We all know each other's names. And this is something that I really noticed when I had my first Zoom symposium, was that before you would have the really important people on a panel, and then the less important people in there sometimes, and people and the really important people that wouldn't knew their names, and the less important people no one knew their names. And then you sort of got there, and actually when you go on Zoom, there's no panel, there's nobody at the front talking, and everybody knows everybody's names, because it's unless I know it's iPhone. But maybe some people's names are iPhone, I guess. So apart from <laughs> iPhone, everybody knows everybody's names. So there's an equality, there's a flattening. So yes, I just think it's probably more complex than one or the other. Sorry. Could, could you go back to the slide on <laughs> the characteristics of uh, the super... Yeah. Um, so did you have people in mind? Do you have examples of people? Who no, I could ask Sam if she could think of any. She probably wouldn't answer right now because it's at the wrong timeline. Um, so this isn't my work, this is the work of someone called Sandra Erdeles. I can send you the papers that she wrote on this. And they, yeah, so she just typed typographies of people. Um, because I think people with, with this profile can make an enormous uh, contribution, but they themselves are drawing on skills, uh, don't necessarily uh, include going through some sort of intellectual accident. They are just serving as catalysts and uh, are very, very good in, um, in, a, in sidestepping boundaries and putting people together. And maybe generating access, yeah. right? And so the type of uh, qualifications you would want someone at the head of a museum or an editor of a magazine or a dean of a college or so. And I was just wondering if the author um, had specified in the paper any specific type. so so she so this particular author looks at um how people encounter information as library studies actually you'll find an awful lot of serendipity researchers are librarians if it's not librarian but people that look at how because that's the first place where there was concern about loss of serendipity was in library and information encountering because we stopped browsing for stuff and we started using a single search bar which requires you to have a semantic understanding of your concept and narrows everything. And so really what she's looking for are people that handle information. So researchers and librarians or anyone that handles information, they're the people that you want that are using moving that information around. And Tom agreed that forgetting is problematic. That's a good reason for it here. So you can, you can read more about it. Here we go. Um, do it forgetting is, you could always unmute Tom if you wanted to and tell us. <laughs> 
to row the whole. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was actually literally just typing a message to say a lovely talk, but I have to go. Okay. <laughs> but um, it's lovely hearing you say that. Forgetting is problematic because the reasons for remembering during problem solving tend to always be present for things you need to forget. I didn't think about pink elephants. The main theory of insight problem solving is one which we are supposed to forget the knowledge we have that doesn't work so we can activate new knowledge. Personally, I don't think you do this. No, thanks no. thanks tom so on this note and thank you so much tom and uh, the rest of the participants online and thank you everyone here we have some uh, two bottles of wine for among five people i think it's gonna be good uh but thank you so much another round of applause for wendy i hope we all have the success